In this lecture, we're going to delve a little deeper into the processes that lead to the distribution of a drug from the central circulation to the different tissues and fluids of the body, and ultimately, hopefully, its site of action. We know that different tissues and fluids in the body vary in their composition. Some have lower or higher concentrations of specific ions compared to plasma. Others have either a higher or a lower pH, and different tissues or fluids may have specific types of proteins in their composition. This differentiation is made possible by barriers between them that are composed of epithelial cells. These epithelial barriers can be classified as either leaky or tight, depending on how strictly they limit the ions and molecules that are able to cross them. The cells of tight epithelial barriers are joined together by tight junctions, which forces ions and molecules to pass through the epithelial cells, thereby providing a mechanism by which um, it can be regulated which ions and molecules are actually able to move across to the other side. Leaky barriers, on the other hand, have gaps between the epithelial cells through which most ions and molecules can pass relatively freely without much regulation. An important component of an epithelial barrier is the phospholipid bilayer of the cell's membranes. The lipophilic nature of the interior of, the, of this membrane limits the type of molecule that is able to cross it. Typically, typically only lipophilic, that is fat-loving or water-repelling molecules that are relatively small are able to cross cell membranes. Endothelial cells, which are specialized epithelial cells lining blood vessels, um, those that line the capillaries to tissues that are separated from blood by a leaky barrier have fenestrae or gaps between them that allow the free movement of ions and lipophilic as well as hydrophilic small molecules. There are, however, several tissues and fluids in the body that are separated from blood by tight barriers. These include the blood-brain barrier, the blood-GI barrier, the blood-testis barrier, the blood-placenta barrier, and the blood-milk barrier. The types of molecules that are able to move from the blood to these tissues tend to be limited to small lipophilic ones. Remember also that, in addition to epithelial barriers between tissues, any drug that penetrates into cells, that is, is able to reach the intracellular fluid, must also be small and lipophilic. This is important for drugs that target sites that are intracellular, like enzymes or ribosomes or DNA. Drugs that can penetrate the intracellular fluid also tend to have large volumes of distribution, which can decrease the drug's concentration at the site of action if, the site, if that site happens to be extracellular. So to recap, small molecules, both hydrophilic and lipophilic, can penetra penetrate across leaky epithelial barriers, which separate blood from tissues like muscle, fat, and bone. However, if a proportion of the drug is bound to protein in the plasma, only the free drug is, is able to penetrate the leaky barriers because drug bound to protein is too large to fit between the cells. There are some drug molecules that are able to cross both leaky and tight barriers, and these tend to be lipophilic drugs that are unbound to plasma proteins. Another factor that we need to think about when we look at the patterns of drug distribution is that once a drug crosses an epithelial barrier into the tissues, it can become trapped in that tissue, either by binding to components in that tissue or through ionization. So we tend to see four patterns of drug distribution through the body. The first is for drugs that mainly remain in the central compartment, that is the central circulation, these tend to be large hydrophilic molecules or drugs with a high protein, a high proportion bound to plasma proteins, and they have a small volume of distribution. Second, we have drugs that distribute uniformly, mostly through extracellular fluid, to tissues with leaky barriers. These are small molecules that are not highly bound to plasma proteins, but tend to be hydrophilic or lipophobic, and their volume of distribution tends to be the same as the volume of extracellular fluid. Then we have drugs that distribute uniformly through total body water, including intracellular and transcellular fluids like the cerebrospinal fluid. These drugs are small and lipophilic so that they can pass easily across tight epithelial barriers and into cells, and they have volumes of distribution that are similar to total body water.
And then finally, we have those drugs that distribute unevenly through the body because they accumulate in specific tissues. These tend to get trapped in tissues after they have crossed the epithelial barrier through mechanisms like binding to tissue components or iron trapping, which we will discuss a little later in this lecture. Some drugs are also active, actively transported across epithelial barriers, which allows them to accumulate at higher concentrations on one side of the epithelial barrier. Drugs that accumulate in one or more specific tissues tend to have very large volumes of distribution. The uneven distribution of drugs in the body has several consequences, including the inability to reach effective concentrations at the target site if the drug accumulates in tissues that are not the target site of action. It can also lead to drugs being effective even though drug concentrations in the plasma are very low if they happen to accumulate in tissues that are the site of action. And then finally, a consequence that is unique to veterinary medicine is that drugs accumulating in tissues could lead to prolonged residues in food producing animals. So let's unpack some of the factors that determine the rate and extent of a drug's distribution through the body. Remember that assuming the movement of drugs through the body is a passive process driven by the concentration gradient, a drug's rate of diffusion across any diff diffusion barrier is going to be directly proportional to the magnitude of that concentration gradient. So blood flow can be an important factor because the faster you can get the blood to that tissue, the higher the concentration of the drug is going to be in that blood. In addition, we have plasma protein binding that could decrease the proportion of the total drug concentration that is actually free to diffuse. And we will look briefly at iron trapping, tissue binding, and transporter proteins. This slide shows the blood flow to different tissues in the body. You will notice that some tissues like the brain, heart, liver and kidneys receive a lot of blood per unit time in proportion to their size. We consider these tissues to be highly perfused. Other tissues like muscle, bone and fat receive less blood per unit time. So this brings us to the classification of drug diffusion as being either perfusion or permeability limited. Drugs with perfusion limited distribution tend to cross barriers including tight barriers relatively easy because they may be, they, they're probably lipophilic. Um, a good example is the anesthetic drug. Are, are drugs like anesthetics like thiopental? For these drugs, perfusion to a tissue is limited only, um, diffusion into a tissue is limited only by how fast the blood can get high concentrations to that tissue. In other words, perfusion. As a result, these drugs rapidly achieve high concentrations in highly perfused tissues like the brain. In contrast, we have drugs for which distribution is limited by permeability. These drugs tend to be hydrophilic and unable to cross tight barriers easily. The limiting factor to their distribution therefore becomes the tightness of the diffusion barrier and we see that these drugs tend to achieve higher concentrations in tissues with leaky barriers like muscle compared to tissues that are protected by tight barriers like the brain. Now let's talk about iron trapping. Many drugs are either weak organic bases or acids, which means that they can become ionized. The proportion of ionized to unionized molecules is dependent on the pH of the environment relative to the pKa of the molecule. This can be calculated using the Henderson-Hasselbach equation. The fundamental principle is that a higher proportion of a weak organic base becomes ionized in a relatively acidic environment, whereas a higher proportion of weak organic acids become ionized in a relatively basic environment. And once ionized, the drug cannot diffuse out of a tissue or be, um, and becomes trapped there. Here we have a table of the pH of different body fluids. Notice the pH can range from as low as 1.5 in the stomach of carnivores to as high as 8 in the urine of herbivores. So it is not surprising that, depending on whether a drug is a weak organic acid or a weak organic base, some will get trapped in, for example, milk or urine, leading to higher concentrations compared to plasma. On the other hand, if the pKa of a drug is such that the, a higher proportion of the, total do, of the total concentration is unionized in the plasma, that will facilitate the movement of the drug out of the plasma into the tissues. We also said that tissue binding can lead to uneven distribution of drugs through the body. 
Drugs can bind to nucleic acids or ions. They can also reach high concentrations in adipose tissue if they are highly lipophilic. Technically, that's not binding, but a function of the drug having a very high affinity for the lipophilic environment. All of this can alter the concentration of the drug at the site of action. Remember that it is primarily free, unbound drug that is available to move as well as bind to receptors that result in the effect of the drug. Finally, we need to mention drug transporters, which are transmembrane proteins that either facilitate the diffusion of drugs across the cell membrane or actively transport them against the concentration gradient. One of the consequences of drug transport is that some drugs that are hydrophilic and therefore not expected to easily cross tight membranes actually do because their movement across the cell membrane or their diffusion across the cell membrane is facilitated by the transporter. If the transport is active, then the drug continues to move across the barrier against the concentration gradient, and this is one reason why drugs can accumulate in tissues. It's important to remember that transport-mediated movement can become saturated, inhibited, or upregulated. A specific kind of drug transporter is the efflux pump, of which p glycoprotein is a typical example. These transporters actually work in the opposite direction. They prevent lipophilic drugs from crossing diffusion barriers by actually pumping them back after they have already diffused through the cell membrane. The peak glycoprotein pump plays an important role in tight epithelial, mem uh, tight epithelial barriers, like the blood-brain barrier, um, and, it play and they play an important role in protecting vulnerable organs like the brain from lipophilic toxins. Here is a list of peak glycoprotein substrates. That's, that means drugs that are actively pumped out of epithelial cells by peak glycoprotein. Um, those drugs of veterinary importance are circled in red. The peak glycoprotein pump can also be inhibited either through competition with other substrates or through direct inhibition. And here's a list of peak glycoprotein inhibitors. Of specific veterinary importance is the fact that some dogs have a mutation in the ABCB1 gene which encodes for peak glycoprotein. Dogs with this mutation have a higher risk for toxicity as a result of exposure to drugs that are substrates of the peak glycoprotein pump due to increased penetration into the CNS, increased oral absorption, and decreased elimination. This is a list of dog breeds showing the incidence of ABCB1 mutation. Notice that not it's that it's not just collie type breeds um, that have this mutation and one must always be aware that it can occur in mixed breeds as well. Luckily genetic testing for the mutation is available and is routinely done at Washington State University and it is important to remember that ivermectin can still potentially be used in dogs with the mutation but that they are much more susceptible to toxicity at significantly lower doses.